Hi there, I'm Jonathan Cooper, I'm an animator at Naughty Dog, and today I'm going to be talking to you about interactive cinematics on Uncharted 4. This is an HD remaster of a talk I originally gave at the Twitch Animation Exchange in February 2017, but it's still valid because we use the same techniques on all our latest projects going forward. So what are interactive cinematics? Well basically, they're any time we're in a unique moment in the game and it's neither full gameplay nor is it full cutscene, but there's something for the player to do. We refer to these internally as in-game cinematics, or IGCs for short, although that's something of a misnomer because, while PS3 era Naughty Dog cinematics were all pre-rendered, all cinematics from Uncharted 4 onwards are real-time in-game, so the distinction is now whether they're interactive or not. So today we're talking about interactive cinematics, but to keep with habit, I'm still going to refer to them as IGCs, as that's how they're referred to in the studio. So a little bit about my background, I've worked on several big games, typically heavy on story, and I've worked on different roles, cinematics are in-game, and usually they're quite separate. Most games have either distinct gameplay or cutscenes, but Uncharted 4 was the first time I had the opportunity to blend the two, as that's something that Naughty Dog really pushes. It was a lot of fun, essentially today I'm just going to talk to you about how fun my job is. Currently I'm creating these kinds of interactive scenes for The Last of Us Part 2, but just bear in mind that Uncharted 4, Uncharted The Lost Legacy and The Last of Us 2 all share similar process and philosophies. So the meat of this presentation is split into three parts. First I'm going to go over my process, the way I typically set up a scene and take it all the way through to the final. Then I'm going to show a selection of examples that illustrate the various technical tricks and techniques that are used commonly throughout the games. And finally I'm going to finish up with a deep dive on Uncharted 4's Madagascar chase sequence that also doubled as our E3 2015 demo. That was one of the most complex scenes to work on, and it really used every trick we have. So first up, process. Every scene has to be set up in Maya correctly, then we're going to bring in props. I'm going to take you through the previous stage, that's a lengthy process where we're figuring out the issues with design via lots of iteration, and once we're done there we go to motion capture. And things can still change after that because the very nature of game development is non-linear but once we're confident in a scene, then we'll hammer on the polish. So starting with the proverbial blank slate, the first thing I'm going to do is bring in a character, in this case the player Nathan Drake, and the next thing we always require is what we call an AP reference. That's short for action pack, and that allows every required animation in the pack to be played relative to this position. There I've slapped on a pose from our library on the character, and I've brought in an NDI camera, short for Naughty Dog Inc, that's automatically exported with the player character's animation. I create a pivot on the character so I can rotate the camera around, and it behaves a lot like it would if you were rotating the gameplay camera via the PS4's DualShock thumbstick. Now I don't start every scene from scratch, I have a bunch of prefabs with various combinations of characters, and sometimes vehicles like the Jeep. So here's Nate's wife Elena in the scene with him. I'm going to drop in what we call the designer block mesh. Now this was still early on in the game, so the designers were still building out the levels. There I created a master mover that can move the entire scene over to the correct location. This allows us to easily move everything in the scene because that happens a lot during production as we're iterating on the level layouts. The scene I'm going to use as an example is simply going through a doorway, and in order to do that I need a door. Now we have a full team that will build props for us, but for something like this, I'll use my fantastic animator modeling skills to build a door. As long as I give it a texture, so it shows up in game, and move the pivots to the correct place, we have a tool that will automatically build it along with its collision, and put it in the game with animatable bones, etc. Now the fun part, actually pre the actions. Now we spent a long time at the start of the project figuring out how much animation is too much, because we don't want to waste time on it here. There's still a high chance the scene will be cut. But we also don't want to just have T-pose characters passing through a door, as we need to playtest this, and that requires players to understand what's going on in the game. Here I'm just pasting poses, using the time slider there at the bottom of the Maya scene to quickly adjust timing. I even mirror Drake's animation across to Elena, just any trick that we can use to save time and get this playable in the game as quickly as possible. Finishing off with a camera pass there, now I've set it up for export in the game. Now the time slider in the bottom, you see I've chopped it up into an entrance into an idle, door bashes, each with an idle in case the player stops midway through the action by not hitting the action button, and then a success at the end. For mocap, we're going to start prepping before we even arrive at the stage. 
So here we are now further on, we've got a more finished environment and I'm bringing in a replica of one of our two mocap stages we have down the road at Sony Santa Monica Studio. This allows me to align our stage in the world and I can bring up our inventory of building props we have down at the stage. Doing this lets me pre-plan the prop build at the stage for each individual scene. Now here I don't care too much about the actual doors themselves, it's more about where the doors are placed. I'll be able to export the scene and bring it back up again when I'm at the mocap stage for us to measure everything out. Here we are shooting the scene and we end up using human doors. That's because the team at the stage know the props best and always have the best idea how to actually build them out. I like to keep it quite loose when planning, I just care about the measurements. What you'll notice here is once they go through the door we've added on an extra story beat to the door bash whereby Nate and Elena will fall onto a sofa and find a note that delivers some important story information to the player. This happens often because we don't want to keep adding IGCs, so we'll take IGCs that already exist and rework them to get more story info to the player. That way we're becoming as efficient as possible with the storytelling. So we'll get our mocap back on a hard drive the same day. We'll then run a batch process to retarget it and add it to our animation library. Then I'll make my selects of the takes I want and just drop it into the scene. I use Maya's tracks editor to sequence it. I'll make my loops and blends at this point, plus any readjustments to have it aligned to the world and update camera pass to match. This is just another quick pass that allows us to get this into the game, because this has to be playable at all time. This is now a much more finished version, still with blocky props, and this will stay in until later in the project when we are confident enough it's not going to change at all and we can begin the mocap polish process. At this stage we're good to go, there's going to be a ton of iteration. This is a snapshot of my version control here, a reminder for animators to always add notes when checking in changes because we're jumping back and forth based on these changes. At this point I'm doing things like polishing up the face after adding facial, polishing the camera motion, adding depth of field, bringing in final props and animating them, making sure all the contact points work with the environment, just everything to bring that Naughty Dog level of polish. So here it is with the final environment. The doors are much better than the prop I made earlier. We've added extra props in there to explain why the door needed to be bashed open in the first place. And we've added a pile of books with a physics simulation on it for extra visual polish. I don't know if you noticed, but now Elena ends on the other side of Nate. That was done after the mocap stage, because we found that the scene just worked better as she walks towards a door on the right. We've also added to the scene further. Nate has an upper body gesture, so he's intently listening. Elena stands and stops in front of the door to prevent the player going through before Elena finishes. Importantly, this section is all under the player control, so we don't know where the player is throughout this. We have a directional gesture on Elena, so she'll always hand a note to him regardless of where he stands. So that's an example of a relatively simple scene that gets more complex over time and illustrates our process for building these scenes. I had 120 scenes of various complexity on Uncharted 4 and there were around 1000 in the game overall. One part of the job that's even more enjoyable than this is coming up with ideas for each sequence long before we even figure out how we're going to do it. This is using the same animation style of quick pose to pose and it's all exploratory previs of what could be awesome. Here I was trying a riff on the classic Raiders of the Lost Ark moving under a truck during the chase sequence. We ended up not going for this because we didn't want to give the player the impression they could drive the truck, so the drivers had to remain inaccessible. But some things do make it like jumping into the jeep, so there's always something that you can take out of these exploratory exercises. I'll show quite a bit of that later. So that was the full start to finish process of a complete IGC. Next I'll go through some of the examples of tricks that we use in order to get them working in game. But why are we even bother making all these scenes unique? You'll notice that if you play any Naughty Dog game, they're full of one-off moments. How we align animations in the world and play actions on moving objects such as vehicles, as well as creating the gestures I mentioned earlier that we're playing on Nate and Elena. And some common techniques that we apply to animations, such as playing them back and forwards, as well as blending between them based on the player's input. And last of all, the process for Naughty Dog's trademark seamless transitions in and out of IGCs and cinematics. So first off, why do we keep creating unique scenes where other games copy and paste and often take a more systemic approach? Essentially, why do we make it so difficult for ourselves? Well, I learned this the hard way. When I first came to Naughty Dog, as I mentioned, I mostly came from a gameplay animation background, 
and was given the task of creating the buddy boosts. You'll see here that my initial pass was to create all the gameplay animations I expected it to require. Entering from different directions, using different speeds, handling various ledge heights to build a system that we could use anywhere. However, I was warned that that's not the way Naughty Dog works. They had tried it before and I learned why. The reason being, and we ended up with 20 unique scenes for buddy boosts, is because you can see already that we're using a variety of character combinations. We also have completely unique backgrounds and we have a level of polish where we want all the hands and fingers to perfectly touch everything they grab so we can't simply reuse the same animations. We also have different props we jump to. We standardise the language of boosting up to ladders, but there are different styles of ladders in different stages. Sometimes the characters are even carrying props, and they're often talking to one another. As I said earlier, every time we have an IGC, it's an opportunity to deliver story to the player, so sometimes we'll even use boosts as transitions into cutscenes. All these mean we can't just use one animation repeatedly, and so it's actually easier for us to maintain on our end if you have 20 unique animation scenes to work with, rather than trying to standardise backgrounds, props and characters across the game. Alignment in the world is something required for every scene, and I showed earlier as one of the first things we include in each scene set up, it's our AP ref, again short for action pack of animations. In this complex example, I've got three in the scene. Uncharted 4 was the first Naughty Dog game to allow multiple in each scene, enabling us to up the complexity. These locators essentially allow each animation we play in the game to play relative to one of these positions. In this scene there are three, a static one at the top of the hill, one on the jeep, and one attached to the player character. Both the falling rock and the jeep are playing relative to the AP on top of the hill there, because that part of the IGC always plays out exactly the same. However, when we go back to gameplay, we don't know where the jeep is because it's under player control. As such, all the characters' animations play relative to the AP on the jeep. This means they get exported as if that position in Maya is the origin, and are then played back relative to where that point in the jeep is. Lastly, we have one that moves with the player character because we have an animated camera that's still playing as we start to climb out. We're giving control back to the player and we don't know where they're going to climb to as we're still blending out that camera animation. Therefore, we play the final camera move relative to the player character wherever they are. For gestures, here's a relatively simple scene where we're revealing a volcano. We're taking control of the camera but not the jeep, although we are limiting the speed, so the jeep can still be driven by the player and rotated and turned around. For the action on Nate's brother Sam as he stands up in the back of the seat, we set it up as a directional gesture by animating the same action three times to cover three different directions, and blending between them based on the jeep's orientation relative to the volcano. We have other simple kinds of gestures on the other two, so their buddy Sully sitting in the front passenger seat has a full body gesture that will take over whatever the gameplay has him doing at the time. Nate however has a point, but we still want him to be driving while pointing, so that's what we call an additive partial animation. He has additive animation on his spine, so he leans forward, retaining the underlying spine movement, and a partial on his head and left arm only, so that the point and head gesture take over 100%. This leaves his right arm to continue playing the underlying driving animations, such as steering and gear shifts. We break the body up into multiple partial sets so we can get really granular with how we break up and combine our animations, so those were three different examples covering the most common types of gestures we use. Something we'll incorporate a lot is scrubbing animations forward and backwards, most often when the player must use effort to lift up an obstacle to get under, and the obstacle can lower back down if the player stops hitting the action button. Here we're using this approach though for what we call a squeeze through. As the player pushes forward on the stick, we're playing an animation forwards with the speed up, and then slow down to stop when they let go of the stick. But it's not as simple as that. We also have an IK track on the hands that run along the wall that will turn on when the player stops so the hands rest on the wall. When stopped, we'll also layer on an additive breathing animation on the player so that while the squeeze forward animation has come to a stop, characters will still appear alive. Using that technique, here's an example of a complex prop scene. We don't always take control of the camera. Sometimes IGCs are just environmental, such as collapsing buildings, where we're mostly just animating a prop. Here's a basic bridge prop I made with a spine rig inside it, and what we're doing here is scrubbing the animation forward as we drive across. If the player turns around and drives backwards, we'll scrub it backwards. Essentially, the frame of the animation is dependent on the position of the jeep on the bridge. But like Sam's jeep standing gesture before, we set it up so that we have three animations, a center, left and right version, and we'll play all three in sync, but blend the animation displayed on the bridge, depending on whether the player drives to the left or right edge so the bridge appears to tilt. As said earlier, we have a full team that works exclusively on the props, 
and they'll take something like that from me and make it much prettier. Here we've got physics on every single plank that bend under the weight of the jeep. Some loose planks will even fall for effect, it's all about conveying to the player that it's a very rickety old bridge. Now one thing we're big on Naughty Dog is smooth transitions in and out of these scenes. One of the key tricks we use to achieve this is to record animation playing in the game, and then bring it back into Maya to get our in and out points. Here you can see in my edited version I can push the camera in and create a scene from climbing over the wall, knowing the exact motion and camera position the action creates. I can just export that section as an IGC, and I'll have the before and after poses for a seamless transition into and out of gameplay, or more often just keeping the start and end poses and insert something entirely different in the scene. As long as it starts from that motion, it'll be seamless. Here's an example of how we keep smooth transitions while offering player choice. In interacting with this tree here, we don't want the player to have to move to the one entry point we've designated with a single AP to start our scene. We found in playtesting that players would often run past the tree then double back and approach from the other side, so we simply placed multiple AP refs around the tree so that the same scene could be played from several angles, with the scene just picking the closest one to the player's current position. This was also our first scene to prototype a new technique we used for smoother camera transitions. Notice that as the player gets closer to the interact point, we're pushing the camera in closer into a preset camera that matches the start of the IGC. Then we play the scene with a fully animated camera, and come back to another preset gameplay camera that as we walk away from the interact point, we pull out to the regular gameplay camera. This avoids unsightly fast camera movements in and out as we interact with objects in the world. We ended up with around 30 different gameplay camera presets that allowed us to better transition in and out of scenes. We would also use this during regular gameplay to affect certain moods, so we had some loose cinematography complementing the gameplay. Because for the first time in the Uncharted series we had real-time cinematics, we could also do these kinds of transitions directly into the full cinematic system. Here's an example where I go back to mocap after the cinematic has been shot and recapture the start with the stuntman to get the hard land on the ground from the rope and then Maya blend it into the full cinematic we're seeing here. While we try to cut into IGCs as little as possible instead of preferring seamless transitions, we are okay with doing it on a player initiated action. Here we're jumping down into the bushes and we know that the player has to do that to trigger the scene so we can cut in. Other examples we use are vaulting over objects or mantling over a wall. As long as the player chose to do the action, it's okay to cut the camera into a scene. So last of all, I'm going to give an in-depth look at the creation of the City Chase sequence, which was the closing act of Sony's 2015 E3 press conference. This was the largest contiguous action sequence in Uncharted 4. I'll start with the initial concept, then on to exploratory previs like the example I showed earlier. Next up are the many prototypes we built for the sequence because it was so technically demanding. Then I'll focus on the polish of the finale bike chase, as that's the section I took to final quality, covering some specific simulation examples that were used to finish this up. The whole sequence from start to finish comprised around 3 months of work, with the final polish phase being just the last 2 weeks before the deadline. So when I arrived on the project we only had a high level direction for the sequence and it was simply described as the best chase sequence we've ever had in an Uncharted game. We only had these two images and basically everything else was up for grabs. Let's start by looking at some highlights of how the sequence ended up playing out. Naughty Dog, we don't have producers, so instead we have to get out our seats and speak to other team members and make our own work. I took it upon myself to start prevising some ideas for the sequence after getting excited when speaking with the designers initially tasked with its creation. So starting with just coming up with ideas, we knew we wanted to be hanging from a rope at some point, so I was asking, what are the fun things that can happen with that? We found it isn't that much fun to have to dodge cars, but it's a lot of fun smashing through things. Here again, I'm recording actions from the game, so that allows me to go into the animation and insert IGC ideas in my hub. The grapple IGC could have been awesome, but we didn't go for it because we didn't want to lose the player's grapple hook. Just like we didn't want to give you the impression you could take over the trucks. While that would be awesome, we always need to balance it with what makes best sense for the story. Here's something that did make it in pretty much as is. 
except we replace the jeep sinking into the ground with the jeep being on fire. That gives the player that added time pressure. Finishing up with a chase on a bike, we knew we wanted a Terminator 2 style nemesis truck that was just really hard to escape. Looking further into what things you can do on a bike but can't do on a jeep or a truck, we kept coming back to the idea of going through small spaces and having the truck smash through behind you. Here I am spending more time on digging deeper into that idea, asking what could the cameras look like and still work for gameplay? How can we get a feeling of aggression from the truck like a bull in a china shop? And last of all, how do we eventually defeat it? We arrived at sliding under something, again something a bike can fit under, but a truck can. I ended up with over 10 minutes of previews to look at when we did sit down to discuss what was going to go into the E3 demo, so it was really helpful to nail some of the story and action beats for the sequence. The next stage is to begin making prototypes in the engine. Here's a prototype of crowds that are not actual game characters, instead just props like the door I made earlier. This keeps them cheap so we can have many. Here's a test with physics simulation on the bike, which ended up not being usable because it just doesn't look that good up close. But we did end up putting it on top of the entire climb system. Here's an early test of what the path might be for the bike chase at the end. Both the bike and truck are on spines here, the same system that we drive the trucks with that we climb over during the rest of the chase sequence. But again, when the camera isn't that close, it just doesn't hold up. So a couple of weeks before our deadline, we decided to record the path back into Maya and just keyframe the entire sequence. So here's what the sequence eventually ended up as once it's had all the polish. We essentially got one minute of streaming animation that plays for this entire sequence with two tracks on the player character, one aiming and one not, that we blend between them whenever you're shooting, and an additive pose so the player can aim his arm with the camera. There's a ton of animated destruction. The small items are calculated in real time, while the larger objects are animated. We have a 30 degree cone in which the player can aim the camera throughout, except for points when we script the angle down to zero to push it through narrow objects before opening it up again. In this final sprint, we're pulling the camera further out and zooming it in to flatten the perspective to make the truck appear closer and right behind you. And finishing with a seamless transition and a full cinematic at the end, as the camera pans around. So little on simulation now that you've seen the final result. I used the Maya simulation plugin throughout the entire project and would use it for something like this because it's actually quite hard to have an object land convincingly after flipping in the air. I treat it just like mocap in that I'm not trying to get it exactly the way I want, I just need it to get as close as I can so that I can keyframe on top and add more weight and have it land in the desired pose for the camera. So here's my final keyframe version of that flip and land. When running the simulation, I'm not actually having it hit objects in the scene there. It's very hard to add direct simulation as it's so unpredictable. Instead, I'm just using cubes to throw it up in the air, and you can see one there knocking the cargo containers over, with an invisible one pushing them out from below, taking the place of the flatbed you slide under. Ultimately, we really want to keep scenes like this very simple gameplay-wise. We don't want the player to die and ruin the flow and excitement of the beat and have to start over again. As such, that sequence has a simple gameplay of just shoot the truck and you'll succeed. But it's very important to include fail states for your action scenes. We don't want the player to see them, but it does cover the instance of that one player who actively tries to break the scene, usually another game developer. So that's how we make interactive cinematics in Naughty Dog. If you're interested in game animation, I keep a website, gameanim.com, where I share everything and anything I find online about the subject, and it usually passes through my Twitter as well. If you want to know more about my personal philosophies on interactivity in cinematography and video games, I gave a Montreal International Game Summit talk in 2009 entitled Cinematic Song Cutscenes that you can search for on the site. Essentially, it's about implementing cinematography in games while still keeping things in gameplay without cutscenes. And last of all, if you're interested more in the design side of the philosophies of interactive cinematics in Naughty Dog, the directors of Uncharted 4 and The Last of Us, Neil and Bruce, gave a great talk at GDC in 2010 called Creating the Active Cinematic Experience of Uncharted 2. We still use all of those ideas and the things they discovered during that project on all our games going ahead. So thanks for watching, I hope this presentation gave you an insight into how and why we create interactive cinematics in Naughty Dog, and wish to see more of this from story-based games in the future. Thanks very much.